Let me welcome uh, you again, uh, those of you here in the room and those of you out there in the virtual world. It's my very pleasant job this afternoon to be the introducer, the introducer of the subject of this symposium, because it's a very unusual topic, given that it's not about the art that artists have made and left behind in museum and galleries, it's rather about something else that they made, the homes and studios where they lived and worked. So just as a way of maybe kicking this uh, off, let me ask rhetorically, since I can't see all of you, but how many of our audience, you can at least sort of uh, pretend that you're waving at me, uh, have visited the following two sites. This one, the site of Jackson Pollock and Lee Krasner in East Hampton, New York. I just see a few hands going up or this one, the Georgia O'Keeffe Home and Studio in Abiquiu, New Mexico. And here we have, I would say maybe two to three times as many hands going up. That's terrific. But what I think I'm most impressed by is that many of you have not been to either site um, because I know that this topic or this kind of destination is relatively new uh, to our country and its availability has really only been uh, made manifest in the last 20 years or so. In fact, it's really only in the last quarter of a century that this country has begun to preserve and open and learn from artist domiciles. We've been much better at saving and interpreting er, artists, uh, excuse me, we've been much better at saving and interpreting presidents' homes and birthplaces or places where George Washington slept or Gilded Age villas and mansions of the very rich. Better at that than the places that creative artists have put together. Only recently have we realized the emotional and intellectual rewards of saving some of the extraordinary physical and material environments that artists created to support their habits and their vision. This symposium will introduce you to you a wide variety of sites, some well-preserved that you can visit, some that alas have been lost, and some looking for fairy godmothers and godfathers to keep them intact. If you stay, uh, stay with us for the weekend, and we hope you will, we will have given you an, expl an exploratory roadmap to what can be learned and experienced in buildings, landscapes, and places that artists create to sustain themselves, their families, and friends. And to be perfectly candid, there's advocacy embedded in this program. We want you to get excited about what this country has done and needs yet to do to preserve a broad-based history of creativity. We want your help in saving artists' places. In my few minutes here, I wanna give you a touch of autobiography and then tell you a little bit about the formation of HAZ, Historic Artists' Homes and Studios, that is a co-sponsor of this symposium. My remarks will be followed by a deeper exploration of Haas by Valerie Bellend, and then we will turn to Joni Kinsey's paper on Grant Wood's two monumental domestic creations, the two that you just heard referred to uh, by Mara, his loft in Cedar Rapids and his mid 19th century historic home in Iowa City. I am something of a junkie on artist homes, and I try to visit at least two new sites every year. I began this in the late 1970s when I was a newly minted PhD art historian undertaking a self-generated self research project, The Life and Art of Grant Wood. In noodling around Iowa to find and talk with people who had known the artist, they invariably brought up Wood's offbeat homes and encouraged me to see them. Both were being lived in, but I found ways to visit them. Uh, uh, and you're going to be hearing much more about them tonight from Joni Kinsey, and then uh, about one of them, the Cedar Rapids uh, studio, uh, Sunday from Sean Ulmer. So I'm gonna say little about them now. Other than this, those sites, once I got into each of them, and I did in this first summer that I was spending in Iowa, became an archive for me. They taught me things about the particular intelligence and talents of this artist 
that I would not otherwise have easily, if ever, uncovered. None of my art tr history training had taught me to probe the physical sites of an artist's life, what we in the academy like to call the material culture that an artist has left behind, to probe it and use it as a way of then explaining better his art. And it's become since then one of my mantras as a teacher, which is to tell my students when they're working on an artist, uh, if they're doing particularly a monographic study on an artist, make sure you go to the site of the crime, by which I mean, go to the site of where something happened, where they lived or where they worked. Wood's attention to detail, his keen sense of design, his humor, his metalwork in the Cedar Rapids loft styled space helped me to see the same elements in American Gothic, which is a painting he made in this very space. I learned, for instance, that he had a builder's intelligence and knew something about architectural styles. No wonder that a little carpenter Gothic farmhouse with its oversized window called out to him in Eldon, Iowa. The fact that he had created with his own hands an unpretentious, multi-purpose, multi-functional living space helped me understand the degree to which he came from the same stock as his hardworking couple with their tidy homestead. I also tracked down Wood's home in Iowa City. And when I knocked on the door, this is in the mid 1970s, uh, apparently I guess I was unannounced at least that's what this nice guy in the lower right tells me. That's Mr. Hayes, Mr. Jim Hayes, who lives there. Uh, he let me in and showed me around. He himself had just arrived in the house uh, uh, a few weeks or months earlier uh, and was just um, settling in. Let's jump ahead then to 1986, one decade later, when I was on a fellowship at the Smith and I lived, I had the pleasure of living in what was called a studio house, capital S, capital H, of a Washington artist, not well known today, but her name was Alice Pike Barney, lower right here. And this was the space that she had designed for herself in the early 1900s hundreds, by Waddy Wood on a very important circle, Sheridan Circle in Washington, D.C. It's a most unusual structure for DC, built by a gilded age woman of means whose other homes were mansions. This one had living quarters in the upper stories, but basically the two lower stories were dedicated to what she thought of as her art spaces. And that's what you see in the two pictures um, in the middle, particularly one's uh, a hallway, or, or, well, they're both, they're both part of the same space, a very large space, as you can see, with a balcony for musicians um, uh, that is at the um, rear. Alice Pike Barney was, like Isabella Stewart Gardner in, Wash in Boston, an advocate for the arts. And she saw DC as a cultural backwater, as it was in her lifetime. There were no, none of the museums it's famous for today had yet been established. She was in a poor marriage. And she traveled abroad to study and basically to escape the home life that was not happy for her in DC. She studied primarily with Whistler and, uh, and that was in both London and in Paris. And she brought back to this country, his ideas about studios that would be open spaces that could serve both privately as a workspace, but also when needed could be cleared out um, or at least cleaned up uh, to become a public space. Her studio had a beautiful tiled floor, um, Tiffany-like windows, and was large enough to host modern dance concerts and Ruth St. Dennis famously danced in it, and also musicals or music ensembles. It also could serve as a gallery space to showcase her paintings and paintings done by her friends. And I should say that the floor is of Mercer tiles, and we'll be hearing a great deal about Henry Mercer a little bit later on in another paper. It's a long story, but Alice Pike Barney's daughters, Natalie Clifford Barney, the poet, lesbian poet, and Laura Clifford Barney gave their mother's home and artwork to the Smithsonian because she'd always wanted to create an art space 
and they received it in 1961. But then in the 1990s, the powers in charge decided to sell the house because as someone put it at the time, the Smithsonian did not own historic homes. They weren't collecting that. Of, of, of the many things they did, that was not one of them. I was continuing to educate myself uh, at that point about extant hardest homes across the country. And I had done enough work to learn that there were only a handful of urban studio houses of this vintage uh, and of this size, and that this was absolutely the only one in the country in the public domain. So when the Alice Pike Barney House was put on the market, I with others formed a group, Friends of Alice Pike Barney, to try and save it. Today, the Barney House is the Latvian embassy. In other words, we failed, the house was sold. But there was a silver lining. Our efforts raised the awareness of the National Trust, then located in the Washington mansion just a mile or two away. The Trust mission is to save physical places of historic and cultural importance. And the Barney House loss made it clear that this country was not doing a good job preserving artist spaces. When this happened 20 years ago, there were artist sites here and there staffed and open to the public. But as I learned, because I researched it further, trying to understand the phenomena of the preserved home, but also the fact that, uh, there was, that, that we all knew so little about them, I found that they were scattered. They had little visibility beyond their local environs. There was no networking whatsoever between them. In what I would now call a visionary um, uh, initiative, the trust, the National Trust went after grant money. Thank you, Luce Foundation. And eventually other foundations like the Wyeth and Terra helped too, to create an umbrella organization of 20 properties across the country. One of the founding properties was the Grantwood Studio Home in Cedar Rapids. It was a membership program, a consortium we call it, that they then named Historic Artists Homes and Properties. These 20 properties be uh, have grown to 55 in number today, hailing from 25 different states. It's a national organization. It includes, and just to give you a, a quick, very quick overview, it includes old master chestnuts like Thomas Cole's studio and not far um, away, the beautiful Olana or Frederick Church studio in Hudson, um, New York. It also includes less known artists, um, who left behind unique spaces, often some of them anyway, are women. And you see here the Grace Hudson house. She was a painter um, and mostly of Native American um, portraits um, uh, in California. Clementine Hunter, an African-American artist who did the murals in Africa House at uh, Melrose Plantation, and Elizabeth Ney in Austin, Texas, who did this wonderful little um, uh, Castellet uh, in uh, what was countryside then and, and did some farming as well. She was a very experimental uh, woman. Along with these, you get many 20th century studios of architectural distinction, such as the Freulinghausen Morris home in Lenox, Massachusetts, uh, that was put together by uh, Susie Freulinghausen and George L.K. Morris. This is in the Berkshires just down the road from Tanglewood. And you can see there at the top two pictures, the in situ murals. This happened to be by Morris, but we have some by, by Susie in the dining room and others by Morris in the living room. They're, they're in situ, they're, they're wall murals. Um, and they also have a collection of European work and beautiful uh, art deco furniture. And below Donald Judd's, um, rehabilitation of a 19th century industrial building, which you can see from the exterior um, in Soho, that he furnished with pieces he had designed, furniture that he had designed, and showcased, uh, use it also to showcase his and his friend's minimalist um, art. Haas sites have to meet certain criteria for membership. They are, have to be authentic sites, not reconstructed. 
They have to be cared for, open to the public, that's very important, and interpreted. Their ownership and administration, however, we have no rules about because it could not be more varied. Some are run by foundations, some by grassroots organizations, some are state or city properties, others belong to art schools, universities, and museums. Two are national parks, St. Gaudens and Weir Farm, and one, Chesterwood, like the home of Daniel Chester French, is owned by the National Trust. And Chesterwood, by the way, is where the head office of Haas uh, is nicely located. Some are completely furnished, some are bare bones. Some have lots of art, like the two examples that you're looking at now, some little to none. However, what they have is site and place. Haas organizes a member's workshop every three years and promotes the sites collectively on an impressive website and in their newsletters. And I encourage you to check that out. Very easy to find. Just put in artist homes and studios and it'll pop right back up. Um, um, I think perhaps I can say the grandest, uh, the, the grandest achievement that Haas has made over the last 20 years is to make the preservation of artists' homes and environments nationally visible. Before I hand over the podium to the woman who manages the consortium, I want to make a last observation. Visiting an artist's home is a very different experience than going to a museum. There are far more var variables to the experience. For starters, visits usually require some planning because most artists don't live on USA uh, main streets. So getting to where they settled becomes part of the experience. And once you've arrived, it becomes an immersive experience in a new place. You move through an unusual space, usually with all your senses at work, seeing, smelling, hearing, and feeling the foreign terrain underfoot. You look in and out of the windows, taking in the nature of living spaces that most likely are different and foreign to your own. The experience may be highly curated by staff or having been highly curated by the artists before them, but often it is not. Many artist places encourage roaming and unstructured imagining as to what it would be like to live there and enjoying the creative soul who's constructed the space. Let me give you a couple of concrete examples of the strange and wonderful experiences that Haas sites afford. For example, getting to Abiquiu, New Mexico to see Georgia O'Keeffe's home and studio requires a major road trip. There are no trains, buses, airplanes that can get you to Abiquiu. Furthermore, you need a reservation, I might add, if you uh, are going to go make sure that you call with plenty of time ahead of time to get your slot because they take very small groups on very special days. You have to drive 60 miles northwest of Santa Fe, and that's downtown Santa Fe in the upper right. You have to leave the bustle of the city, drive past the malls and strip culture of gas stations and fast food, get past Española and begin, and there's my map, our site is uh, the circled abiquiu. Um, I can see that Santa Fe uh, hasn't been circled, but it's down there in the, in the middle of the, the bottom uh, part of the map. Anyway, you have, to, you have to get out of Santa Fe, past Española, the last big city you go, go by, um, or significant city, and begin to enter then into a landscape like the two pictures below show you that is untouched and lightly inhabited. You may even feel a little hallucinatory as you drive into this world that the locals, including the native and Hispanic cultures that have lived here for centuries, call home, but is spectacularly foreign to those of us who live in cities and suburbs elsewhere. The journey from Santa Fe to Abiquiu um, is it, it reiterates the very one the artist took. Uh, she went from city, New York, in, in fact, um, but even once she went from New York to New Mexico, she had to find uh, this particular space and she did it by moving further and further away from civilized centers such as Santa Fe and also um, Taos. So you, in fact, you kind of reiterate the way um, the artist left 
the hustle and bustle of um, an organized town uh, to get out uh, into the open spaces. And that's an important part of the experience, just getting there. It tells you how determined she was to live in this dry and lunar landscape of her own choosing and to carve out an alternate life from the one she lived in a New York high rise. You experience, in other words, something of her willfulness and independence, just getting to the beautiful home she made in the village of Abiquiu. Second example, sometimes the journey to and from are, is not the memorable part, but just negotiating the site. Flat shoes with rubber soles are recommended footwear when visiting Manitoba the home and grounds that Russell Wright, the mid-century designer uh, of dishware and furniture, built over a number of years. Wright acquired 75 acres of untouched boulders, waterways, and woodlands just off the main road in Garrison, New York on the Hudson River. His was something of a manic project, the creation of a completely orchestrated world that today is presented as if Wright has just left momentarily, perhaps for a day of business in Manhattan, the tables are set, the beds made, the waterfalls are gurgling, the trees changing colors, the paths slippery with moss. Here's a modernist who wanted his lived environment to be simple and functional, but also a perfected multi-sensory miracle on the Hudson. He was a 20th century idealist, creating a domestic campus for himself, his family, and his friends, impossible to replicate today. It's a unique, utopian, very modern, visionary space. One final example to underline the depth and variety in artist sites. In this case, a city home that is relatively easy to get to in South San Francisco, if one knows it's even there amongst the taverna and burrito shops and other Victorian homes like it is itself. The house is there on the left. It sits in a landscape in the Mission District of noisy streets um, and ordinary work, working and middle-class homes. This is David Ireland's project called 500 Cap Street. In the Mission District, a crowded ethnically um, mixed region of the city. Ireland is a conceptual art, was a conceptual artist. He bought the house at 500 cap to live in and proceeded to do so. But along the way, he decided to go hybrid and create his home as if he was creating a work of art. He spent years using the patinas, the distressed materials and the things like brooms he found in the decaying building to create varnished mustard colored walls and, a ma magical and magical assemblages of artifacts. Visiting his house is a totalizing experience, one room after another of surprises and cleverness. You feel extremely alive in these spaces, privileged in fact, to be a David's guest in a house he transformed. He too seems present, just off for the day. One last observation. I'm always looking for signs of new interests in artists' environments. Over the last decade or so, there has been a surge of books about artists' homes and studios. These I took right off my own library shelves. They tend, however, to be picture books, very heavy on color photography and very light, L-I-T-E, on history. But they do indicate a curiosity and respect, if you will, for the artist's way of life. They're almost voyeuristic, some of them, about the artist's way of life. These books highlight the artist's customary resistance to fashion and high style decorating and dwell rather on the nonconformity, the countercultural, and the hyper personalizing of living spaces. I confess that I yearn for fresh scholarship. Um, in my books on artists' homes and studios and, and choke rather on those that sensationalize and over aestheticize offbeat spaces. My preference is for a book like this one written by our next speaker, Valerie Belent, 
the first guide to Ha's properties. Valerie's account uses straightforward documentary photographs of each site accompanied by introductory historical texts. She gives us a fact-driven armchair journey across the country to visit these unique places, creating a hunger to get in your car and go see them for yourself. And I, um, I would recommend this book to you, which is easy to uh, find at almost any of the artist sites sell them, but you can also find it at, all, at your um, usual uh, depositories uh, for uh, book sales. Valerie, is the senior program manager of Haas. Before taking on this lead position, she worked at many different artist sites, including 17 years on the curatorial staff of Olana, the home of the Hudson River School painter, Frederick Church. Her Haas office is, I said earlier, at Chesterwood, the home and studio of the 19th century sculptor, Daniel Chester French, whose studio you're seeing right there gracing the cover of her book. It's a national trust property in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. I'm now going to um, have uh, Valerie step up to the podium and bring the story of Haas that I've introduced to you here into the 21st century. She's titled her talk, Yesterday and Tomorrow, Reframing the Historic Artists' Homes and Studios Program. 